you will either have made an excellent purchase or have made a decision to not purchase it for the better. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't know if, I'm, if I can. Right now, I'm kind of downsized. <laughs> Welcome to off. Oh man. <laughs> Second time ever. Second time ever. Uh, Last time it was with Jeep, a, a Jeep rep, Scott Talon, that I flubbed oh, the intro. Yeah. Thanks. Let me try again. I know. Welcome to the Off the Road Again podcast. I'm Chris. I'm Ross. And I'm David. <laughs> this is our podcast about anything and everything <laughs> off road. Uh, tonight we're socially distanced as always. Uh, we're we are magically back. By coastal again, even though I didn't think we would be. I'm in Kansas mm-hmm. City, Russell in the Northeast, and David is all the way out in California, getting ready to have already been to King of the Hammers, based yes. on when the show will air. Right. Yes, it was <laughs> weeks ago. Yes, it was amazing. It was great, great right? time. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So Lauren, Lauren Healy will have already received my email about coming on the show <laughs> by the time this airs. <laughs> Regardless of how Lauren Healy actually finishes. Uh, that video wins yeah that video was amazing um what do you have here about oh the charity auction for the the tundra capstone yes that that uh that news is as of a few hours ago i believe and the uh the we know the capstone is toyota's new trim for their ultra luxury high end for the cap for the cap it's literally the cap it's, it's capping off their stone and uh the production vehicles we don't know about Sequoia, but Tundra is like 73 grand to get in the door for a capstone uh, four-wheel drive Tundra. And the first Tundra capstone just auctioned for $700,000, which wow. we know from... Is it because it looks better than the TRD Pro that somebody was like, fine, 200 more grand? Probably. 200 <laughs> more grand. It's like, yeah, just add another zero. Um, yeah, but we, yeah. we know with these auctions that anything over the base MSRP is a tax write-off because it's a charity auction. Yeah. Um, who Who is that that does that with the Corvettes all the time? He just bought the first new Z06. Hendrick? Like, yeah, Rick Hendrick. Yeah. He paid like $3.6 million for the new Z06, yeah. the first VIN 0001. So it's like it's so, win-win because the charity gets money and yes. he gets a tax write-off. So I Exactly. I think a lot of people get super mad. They're like, oh my gosh, if I had that kind of, you don't. So stop. No. Like, no. don't. <laughs> and it, it's probably a business expense, anyways. So, exactly. Double tax write off. So, yeah, I just wanted to mention that because that's been hundred thousand numbers. $700,000 is the same number as what Tundra owners aspire to get to without breaking the engine open on mileage. Yeah. You know, true. so I've, I've driven the new Tundra. Uh, Have you? Yes, it was, uh, it was a, few, a couple months ago in San Antonio. Um, Toyota really, you know, press events are, you know, that's not like my favorite part of the job, the press event thing. But I, the, the one, th- what is my favorite th- part of the job is when engineers get to actually talk. Like relax at, and have like, some adult beverages. and Yeah, it, it, right, right. <laughs> so so um, at the press event, uh, there were... There were quite a few engineers, and they, they had a bare chassis, you know, fully outfitted, you know, frame, power train, drive train. Yeah, and it was all labeled. So, uh, you know, color-coded, and, uh, and they even took us to the manufacturing plant and walked us through the manufacturing process. It was legit. Like, that was, that was badass. I mean, th- there were certain, you know, it was a while ago, so – certain things that I forgot, but like the, the things that I remember were um, there were certain sections of the frame that they locally, they, there were like s- stronger sections of steel that were locally welded in. Okay. So like you'd have a frame section and there would only be p- part of it. You'd see the, the outline of where the, the stronger steel is. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I also recall the hybrid having, yeah, there you go. They, can't, they don't use lithium ion batteries on these. Like it's 2022 and they're using, what was it? Nickel, 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 nickel metal hydride, I think. Yeah, yeah. Um, and that's, I think that's, it's old school, but you it's know. It's less expensive, but it's also less power dense. 
Yeah, but you know, in terms of supply concerns, like you could probably alleviate those. Mm -hmm. So anyway, yeah, look at this thing. That's interesting. This, this was just awesome. The fact just that going, they actually let you look at the guts of it. Like, oh, 100%. Um, and you could see like the, uh, the small overlap provisions there on the frame behind the mm -hmm. front tires. Yep. De definitely, you know, oftentimes you'll just see like a, just a rail that's just like perpendicular to the main rail. Just a, it looks a little, you know, like an afterthought kind of, but this is like integrated into the frame. Um, yeah, this was cool. And, and the cooling system up front is, let's see if we can. Enormous. It is expansive. It's unbelievably huge. It's un nope. it, That's the first thing you notice when you step in front of the new Tundra is the openings in that grill are freaking huge. And you can they're see real everything. Openings, right? They're, they're actually, it's not like the like, oh, they're open. outgoing Civic SI or anything or the, you know. So for, for the listener at home. KJ was talking about this. KJ Jones yeah. was on the last show, and I could not find the image to save my life. So One Google search tonight, and I have like all of the images I need. So, so two things about that. The first thing is that I think a lot of people don't realize that parts and like build components are sourced from different places and then assembled. Like, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the motors for the JL Wrangler, you probably have experience with this, but they might not be built in. The factory they're built somewhere no. else brought yeah, right. to the factory and then smushed into a thing mm -hmm. um the other interesting thing is coming from you especially it's good to hear that the actual frame is impressive because i don't know if you've had a chance to look at a tacoma frame and i say this lovingly as a toyota fanboy but the tacoma frame is not impressive mm. um, i went there's... through the toyota frame recall on my tacoma i was supposed to get a brand new one that's part of it but there's also just it's not fully boxed it's just open yeah. channel on it's most oh, channels yeah. you know oh. which is uh it, it's it's 2022 honestly the, the modern tacoma it shares a decent number of architectural components with the last generation tacoma yeah so it, it's same you know, for the fifth and fourth gen four owners i remember so i was on the oh man i've been in this business a long time well not that <laughs> not that not, not that long like it's, the, it's not that many years but it feels like it's right. that many years oh yeah yeah <laughs> uh, my first press event, uh, I just left Chrysler and I was now a writer for Jalopnik. Uh, this was 2015, summer 2015. My boss at the time, Patrick, calls me and says, start driving to the airport. I'm like, what? He's like, get in your car, drive to the airport. You're going to, you're, you're, we just got invited to the Tacoma thing. And the flight's in two hours or four hours, whatever it was. Oh, oh wow. So I just grabbed some clothes, threw in a in a uh drawstring bag and just booked it Miss, missed the flight but got the next one <laughs> and um uh, yeah so i remember speaking with mike squeers uh chief engineer for the tacoma total badass by the way um badass because he's like he'll talk you through uh, uh the engineering behind some, something mm -hmm. without being too afraid to admit that there are compromises like that that's the most frustrating uh, thing about being a journalist is, especially one who knows how engineering works, engineering is just, it's just intelligent compromising. Mm -hmm. And you often find automakers will be too afraid to say that there's any sort of compromise that took place. Right. They and so- Dying on that hill. Right. And so you Whatever can't- Whatever it takes. So you can't tell the real engineering story um, because that's inherent to what engineering is. Anyway, um, yeah, so- I remember getting there um, and, you know, talking to Mike Squeers and, and I was just like, well, fundamentally, how different is this to the, to the last one? Because it doesn't really need to be any much different, does it? I mean, it's body on frame still. You yep. still have a solid rear axle, independent front suspension. You've got some sort of, you know, V6. Maybe there's some powertrain differences. But like, really, wouldn't it be silly to just do an entirely different frame from the ground up and everything different? All why? It's this. It's basically oh. the same truck in so many ways, right? And yeah, that's ultimately like he wasn't afraid to say. Like I will say, many automakers would be like, "It's completely one hundred percent new." You know, mm -hmm. this is an all new vehicle. And he's like, "No, there's some parts of it that are like, you know, shared with the old one." That's just well, you know, so that was six years ago. We've seen that twice in the last two years with the new Frontier and the new Z car. You know, and I think it's fine. I think it's fine. Nissan, like. Ultimately, 
you hit like critical mass for where you can go with development dollars. And, and in terms of what the customer wants out of a truck, like why change? Well, you know, unless there are complaints about the suspension design or the frame, you know, and, and especially in that segment, the midsize truck segment, which by the way, is the most stagnant automotive se- segment of any segment. <laughs> oh God. Um, I mean, Ford Ranger is 12 years old. <laughs> yeah, it's a stagnant set. It, 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 I remember when I when I reviewed the J, the JT Gladiator, I was like, man, this is just a Wrangler with a bed. But it, w- what's better than it right now? Tacoma's old, Rangers pretty much old, old, Frontier's old, and I'm just like, Colorado's really old. It's like, wow, Colorado this really. really it's like, wow, this really. It feels better than the other ones because it's like significantly newer the platform is right. <laughs> um, and just different like we've gotten so used to frontier tacoma and colorado canyon you know that just having a, a wrangler with a pickup bed makes it feel like a totally different thing i still haven't yeah. driven one i need to, need to figure that out i will say that yeah these automakers have found a yeah. they've, they've done a good job at making an old platform feel you know good still like I, I wouldn't say the gladiator is far and away the best mid-sized truck i don't even know if it is the best truck i haven't driven the new Col- uh, colorado which you know it's got a what an eight speed and a like i don't know i haven't driven that the newest it's one yet fine the colorado and canyon are like they start and end it's, with fine there's um, a new interior like i remember the the, the interior fine. when i drove it was whack it, it, was, it was it used to be bad the shifter in the colorado and canyon it looks like it's 2003 it's oh, still, offensive. still, oh, didn't scary. they update it like this year? I don't know. Is it, is it column mount or is it? No, it's center console shifter, but it's just like one like stick with like a hand that comes up. Can, can we agree that all trucks, if they're automatic, should be column shift? Yes, a hundred percent. Okay. Or even my brother had a Ram with dial. More great. No dial. It's just better than it taking off the center up console. Center what console. Are we doing? No, column. Just do my. That was I, the worst. Don't do that. Mannerism ever. Don't do that. I like no, the column shift. There's, there's like nothing wrong with the column shift, <laughs> and it also just makes you feel tough, man. I don't know why. Right? It's like, let me put this sucker in reverse. Yep. I mean, it's great. <laughs> so okay. I real fast fun anecdote. We have a 2017 Suburban with the column shifter. We have a 2008 Sequoia without the column shifter. My wife and I took the Sequoia to run an errand the other night. And we, I had pulled into something, got something real fast, hopped back in the truck when we went to pull out and literally did the motion. Lift. To did you shift sh- the turn signal? I No, I just shifted air. Cause I didn't even, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. on the column shifter, it's so far away from the, the wheel. Like it's just out there. The, I just went, and she looked at me with the rear silk and I was like, I drive the Suburban too much. It's up <laughs> yeah. Like I had a, yeah, sorry. That's awesome. Back on track, sorry. Just to, uh, just to go back on track. For the record, the Gladiator is 218 inches long. It's a mid-size pickup. Um, big ass truck. Wait, that's a big. That's a lot. Aren't of fucking... Suburbans like two twenty one? Two twenty one. Yeah, they are. That's out of my brain. Yeah, that's that's a lot of uh, a lot of vehicle. That's that's five inches longer than a Grand Wagoneer. The Gladiator, unfortunately, that's the one thing. I actually, I have some what two twenty one. I have to say, I, I like the Gladiator, but there are some real compromises that are just a product of it being based on the JL. That, I mean, if you look at the Gladiator's length, it's literally limited by what is the smallest five foot bed plus bumper that you can put behind a second row of a JL. Mm-hmm. Like there's no extra length. Look at the back of that truck. It is the second row of a JL plus 5.0 feet, basically. <laughs> and, and you realize that all these other trucks, they are, they're shorter for a couple of, for a couple of reasons. Uh, the big one is that I guess it happens between the very front and the windshield or somewhere in there. There's just this added length. Mm-hmm. And also, um, yeah, that's, that's, that's it. That's just that it's well, just got a big nose. So the gladiator has the JL's front bumper. Most of the, if you look at the Colorado or the Tacoma, it's flat. The nose is just flat. The same oh, way it? that a normal SUV's front end oh. is just flat. So that adds what eight inches, and then also we know that a V eight fits. Oh, it is flat kind of a JL. So there's another what six inches or so of real estate between. Well, that was never. It wasn't really. It wasn't. It wasn't meant to fit a V eight. Wasn't meant to. Not in the early days of development. 
<laughs> See, pretty sure this guy's going to know, Russ. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, I can only look with my eyes. I haven't been back there. In the early JL days, there was no mention of any V8 ever. All there was was diesel, two-liter GME T4, and that two-liter, it's funny, it's a four-cylinder, but it's what set the nose length. Because, you know, you've got four cylinders uh, lengthwise versus yeah. three and three on a V6. Yeah. But, but, but that's not really it. It's, the, it's all the cooling system components, man. It's a pain in the ass on that, <laughs> on that boosted two liter. You've got all these, you know, liquid cooled radiator. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it, it's, you, especially when you add mild hybrid components. It's, right. Right. It, I remember they added, I think it was like in the first like few months of development, I think it was 30 millimeters to the cow length just to fit what they called 10 pounds of shit in a five pound bag. <laughs> that's, that's literally what the, the CAD engineers would say. It was a crude bunch sometimes, but very yeah. brilliant people there. Yeah, so exactly. four, four by E wasn't even a consideration when JL debuted. It was shoehorned in afterwards. Um, the early days was just mild hybrid development and plug-in hybrid it was definitely sort of like a, the next step after I left, like we weren't doing much plug-in hybrid development um, in the early days. So yeah, it, I recall the two liter really being that. And also of course we had to fit the three liter diesel, um, which also was not easy to, yeah. to fit. It, it's yeah. funny you mentioned plugins because that's our next news thing. <laughs> Is oh. it? You Wait had a, a Winnebago ERV on here. Oh yeah. I threw that in there. <laughs> because I thought you would like it. I love it. So, it's a transit a, RV base. How, I like that dog. How about that dog that you showed in that picture? That's Seriously? Like golden wow. Dog. That's what do you like every thing. other doodle owner in the entire country? Like, come it's on, man. Still dog. get a rescue. It's cute dog. I, I should <laughs> just get a rescue. Uh, yeah, so Winnebago is doing an electric RV. It's. I like know, the interior. The interior is very like, I live on the Starship Enterprise. Like, I, I'm, I'm down with this. The like, plants on that shelf are going fucking flying. Exactly. It's a bump. But yeah, yeah. you know, it, it's, it makes sense because realistically, most Winnebago owners, most RV owners are just going to kind of bounce from like park or, park to park. you know, place they can just hook up to the provided electricity and plumbing. Um, but yeah, I, I will say like it. It wasn't easy getting an exterior image that was in a good resolution. There, like I don't know what's yeah. happening with. Well, hopefully, hey. they spent their money just developing powertrain. But you know, there we go. Mo Motor Trend was nice and had one for us. The Thanks, guys. next thing, and the reason that I wanted to bring this up is that from here, do we start seeing electric Earth roamers and Earth cruisers? You know that kind of stuff. Is that going to make its way into the off road world? Because Reality is something like that. Weight doesn't fucking matter. Knowing you know, if it weighs thirteen thousand pounds to start, if you throw batteries in instead of, and you know electric motors instead of a V eight diesel, like the, uh, and, this is this is a tough sell right here. This this RV here. It depends on the kind of the kind of camping slash RVing you're doing. I mean, if you are staying local to one area, bouncing from campsite to campsite, plug it in, sure. But if you're trying to if you're trying to roam the country, and you've yeah. got 125 miles of range, this is just not going to mm -hmm. work. And and it, it's tricky it's tricky to discuss this um, because obviously you know electrifying is is an important thing for for climate change. But I think it's okay to say 125 miles of range, maybe not what everyone wants out of an I, RV. Oh, it's nothing. 125 yeah. pennies so, on the dollar. But. To to your point, Ross, knowing knowing who. And I, we have only talked with one owner of these companies that you listed. <laughs> Earth Roamer, please return my emails. Um, yes, <laughs> Lance at Earth Cruiser, like they're Chevy 350s under those Azuzus. And I think he will stay with that because of, oh Parking man, I'm going to use the wrong word here. Their ubiquitousness, like they're yeah. everywhere. You can get That words. is the word. That's the word. Yes. I might write words for a living. Who knows? <laughs> um, <laughs> but because of that, like, and even like uh, when we talked to Scott from Far From Home Podcast on the mm -hmm. Mongol Rally, where he ended up in the one country that didn't have Nissan parts. Yeah. They only had yeah. Chevy parts. Like that like, Chevy V8 is throughout the world at this point. You it's join awesome. off roads using off the shelf Ford parts for everything. You know? Yeah. 
I, but, I may have sent him a, a message about four by four ambulances the other day. I, I had a rough day. You had I a weird was, day the other day, dude. I did. I, I saw that message and was like, oh God, he derailed Just, some shit. Yeah, that but, was my goal. So that's so, uh, I, again, this it, to me, this is a marketing piece. Like they they took the the transit platform that I'm sure Winnebago has been working on for years. So I was like, they have an e-transit, let's do a fun. Let's take a couple deposits. There are rich dudes that'll be like, sure, who cares? Like think about think about what else it would have taken to get anyone to write about their company. Like it's like, mm. like this is a no-brainer. You're gonna write about it because it's you know, yeah, it's a different it's a, hot, it's a hot topic. Right, right. Do you think there is an because their rebels are 125k RVs monthly? Do what? You think there's an alternative fuels RVs monthly? Like there will be easy. soon if it's not <laughs> yet. Like they're probably oh, a bunch of biodiesel from like pouring out used grill oil <laughs> to run their old Mercedes. I don't know. Oh, I will say, I will say that as it's a, I will say that generally I'm, you know, from a from a um from a actually from the standpoint of actually camping, having a big battery on board is freaking legit. I mean, yeah. it is clutch. I mean. You know, I, I looked at that the Rivian. You just pull a, a freaking freaking stove out of the out <laughs> yeah. of the vehicle, and you don't have to hook anything up. Zero. It's just yep. using the battery and cooking your food. And you know, you can work. You can run all sorts of resistance heaters and blowers to keep to stay warm while you're plugged. Like it is, it's awesome. There's no Enjoy. question. Yeah. Uh, it's just a matter of like this is an RV, and you're supposed to you're supposed to bomb 900 miles a day. Right. I mean, some I people guess. do it. So, yeah, but there's also people that go no, yeah. from, you know, like North Florida to the middle of Florida and yes. park for, you know, six days. So if Fine. you were going to 24 hours of Daytona last weekend, this would be sick. going from like Miami to Daytona, yeah, yeah. perfect. Absolutely. Especially as soon as you get to the campsite, you plugged it in and then you just yeah. had a giant battery pack the whole right. time. You don't you have, have gas. Fuck it. Awesome. I, we need I, seat time in a Rivian. That's what has to happen. Yes, you do. That was, I have to say, the Rivian R1T is the first car, the only car I've ever driven. And I remember I helped develop the Wrangler and I went to the press drive. When I got out of that R1T, I was just speechless. I, I'd never felt that way. Like, you know, I drove the new Bronco and I was like, this is dope. Of course, the Wrangler that, you know, that I, you know, that I got to hang, deal with when I was an engineer, that was cool. But the Rivian was like a holy shit moment. It really was. I'd never experienced something that was so far beyond anything I'd ever, I'd ever seen or felt. And it was so, it was like, wow, like this is the, and I wasn't going in as like a, a big, you know, EV proponent or anything i'm kind of neutral on that but i came out and i was when i oh my gosh when i drove it so i was blown away you're echoing pretty much what everybody we've spoken to is has said like we had so you know that motor trend did that crazy trip, yeah. the trail trip so we had holman and we had lieberman mm -hmm. and um i think we talked about it with doug briefly but you know but electric plus, cars plus what emmy hall racing it in the rally yeah, like right also that that actually feels like a long time ago though in, in rivian <laughs> world was it? Oh, god what is time um but you know electric cars are one thing we know the entity of an electric car and what that territory brings with it mm -hmm. but people in the off-road world tend to be so tied to their ways that hearing people like you come in and say like shit's cracked Oh, or what all it's cracked up to be, whatever. Yeah. You know, like it, it drives home the fact that this is for real and it's, not just like another blip on the radar. It's for real, man. I, everyone needs to drive that truck. I I'm campaigning that I get to, cause I'm the closest to the plant. Like you Ross is in Connecticut. He gets all the other stuff cause he's close yep. to the press fleets and I can check shit. Let me, Rivian, let me drive this. <laughs> Does the front end look awkward in person? Not even slightly. It's the most no. badass looking truck there is. Yeah, it's it not looks even, great. I have not seen even, it. It's an old design. We we saw it like five Dude. years ago, four years ago, and it's still. I saw it in person at the New York Auto Show in like 2018 or 17 or something. Camille yeah. and I were like seven cappuccinos deep, and we we're like, "Oh my god, this is awesome!" And the guy was standing on the pull-out platform. <laughs> uh, 
I, I still want that. I want the SUV. I want to. I want to be able to throw all four kids in the back of it and use the frunk to put our stuff and. That color somewhere. is fantastic. I love the I want green. Yeah, everything to be painted that color. I agree. Maybe we'll wrap the suburban that color. <laughs> We're not wrapping the suburban. Uh, that'll be seven thousand dollars. Exactly. Much cool stuff you can buy for seven grand. Ha- so, have you driven almost a cars? Wrangler? Almost Wrangler. Almost <laughs> a particular JK. Um, have you <laughs> driven anything else that has wowed you as much as the Rivian since we spoke last? Yeah, actually, a uh, 1957 uh, Willys FC 170. Ah, uh, 50, actually, it's a, it's a 58. Uh, that vehicle has wowed me more than any vehicle ever. Um, That's a bold statement. Yeah. Uh, well, <laughs> this is this is that you know the vehicle that I bought in Seattle and uh, that had been abandoned for probably 20, 30 years. And the, it was it wasn't it didn't wow me more than the Rivian because it was a better vehicle in any real <laughs> objective way. It wowed me in the the disparity between like how well it drives compared to how well I expected it to drive, which okay. is not at all. You know, <laughs> the okay. Rivian I thought would be good and it was excellent. Mm-hmm. This FC I thought would be com- dead forever. And then it actually drove really well. It, um, yeah, look at that thing. By, by drove really well, do you mean like didn't kill you and you're here to talk about it? Or like it's actually a competent vehicle? Oh, no, no. Well, that, no, no. Well, <laughs> anyone, oh man. So it's kind of tricky to drive because if you go back to that picture, you'll see, um, I might not, no, it's not, it's not in that picture. The windshield is busted directly in front of the driver's face. That isn't really the tricky part. Uh, the, what makes it difficult to drive is one. not that one. Um, not that one. We'll have to find, find another one somewhere. Um, the, what makes it difficult to drive is to start it up, you have to hoist a jerry can on a wooden pole. Oh, I got uh, it. There you go. Yes, there it is. <laughs> So, okay, uh, let me just walk you through the starting sequence. All right, first things first. You grab the jerry can, which is a uh, ratchet strapped to the wooden pole and tied to it with some 50-50 cord. Uh, you grab that little assembly out of the bed and you shove it into the bedside. Then okay. you undo the cap in the jerry can, shove the hose in. The hose is tied to the top of the wooden pole. And then you shove the other end of the hose into the carburetor, which is between the driver and passenger seat, which... <laughs> <laughs> which, aren't, which aren't there, I should be clear. The driver's seat is just towels. Um, next step is there's a little valve. You can see right next to the, where it enters the window there. Yeah. There's, a, there's a valve and a fuel filter. You have to open that valve. Then actually, okay, then you have to go back in the Jeep. Uh, you have to siphon the fuel with a hand pump. And then you, okay, then you plug it into the carburetor. Okay, so then you've got the fuel system all set up. Everything's good. You got fuel going in. Next step is you have to get, uh, you got to get it firing so you have to there's a wire in there um that goes from a six volt battery there's a six volt battery on the floorboard you have to hook that wire to the ignition coil so then you have spark and then the final step is you have to crank it it won't crank on six volts so you have to oh god i'm I'm getting tired even mentioning this um (laughs) how long does this process take it takes too long. But point is, you have to use another <laughs> battery, a 12-volt battery, to crank the starter motor. It's a pain in the ass. So you have a 12-volt to crank it, but then you have to switch to the 6-volt to keep it For running. the lights and the ignition and everything, yeah. Okay. Oh, you can see in this picture here, sort of, uh, if you go down and left from my right elbow, right there on the tunnel, like somewhere in that area, a little bit down, there is a hand throttle, which is just a choke, because the gas pedal literally rusted off. So I just... Uh. I just use repurpose the choke for the, the throttle thing. So oh it's, pr- it's pretty hard to drive because the choke always gets stuck and it's either full throttle or it's no throttle. But, uh, but it's no. It's so great. I drove this thing off road for seven straight hours. Um, and it, it's only remarkable if you see what shape it was in in, in the beginning, particularly what shape the engine was in. 
Dude, you, it was you gave us a guided tour last time. Like you pulled yeah, the engine was, covers off with that them. was our last show. <laughs> wow. Okay, so I was in the garage when when we yeah. did this last. It was huh? partially from the FC. I was. I have to apologize if I was out of it. Like then, I don't remember anything from that show. I literally, I was blacked <laughs> out. I don't know. I was living in a Land Cruiser at the time, <laughs> down by a river. I was li- sleeping in the second row of a 2002 Lexus. Oh god, Lexus. that is definitely the modern version of that. Is living in a Land Cruiser down by the river. <laughs> I was living in the second row of that for um, days at a time, covered in grease, fixing a Jeep that really I did not think would ever run. I didn't really know what. I it was just kind of. I was just. I don't know. I don't know what I was thinking. But um. But it was epic. That's. Uh, that's absolute madness. Um, this is this is my favorite Jeep ever. Is the FCs? I, this exact one? Well, maybe not this exact one. We'll based on one. the definitely based on the process you just described. Uh, but the way this one looks, I've I've looked for years, and you can never find one that I I don't have enough welding skills. To, uh, I don't favorite, have any welding skills. Favorite Easter Jeep Safari concept. Oh my god, ever. I love oh, yes. Safari is that the thing FC. Is so yeah. fucking good. That Especially is. when you see people turn it into like a van too. Like just oh, you mean the canoe? Yeah, well, it, now it's the <laughs> canoe, but then it was an FC concept that someone turned oh, into yeah, a van. Good. So good. How much you gas is in that floating jerry can? Five gallons. A full five gallons? Yeah. So yeah, it, you ran through five gallons in seven hours? Um, I think in seven hours, I, I think I maybe used roughly five gallons. Okay. Yeah. So, roughly. I, I think that's impressive. So... <laughs> yeah, You're no, right. driving driving this thing off-road. First off, this thing this thing is basically a zombie. It, it's a dead Jeep that's somehow alive and I was just like I'm not questioning it. I'm <laughs> just going to I'm going to drive it's it. It's got <laughs> blood dripping off its face. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. The, driving this thing, looking through the cracked windshield, anytime you hit, you go into like a into a hole. It feels like you are about to run into earth because there's no nose in front of you, you know. What's yeah. the Weight distribution. Look at the rear tire. Everything's it, in the it, front, it, Ross. Is it, it like always, 73? It like, always lifted those rear tires. Like, oh, like those tires, it was it would always lift them off road. Um so, okay, so what so is like the if, weight distribution? If David leans just one. a little more, the whole truck's just gonna go over. Yeah, right. well, I can tell you that on oh, the no on, yeah, on the two-door model, the FC 150, of which I, I also own one of those, but it might be stolen. That one has a huge 260 pound counterweight in the back to make sure it doesn't endo when you break. Really? This one's a okay. little bit longer, but doesn't have the counterweight. So, yeah, I'm curious about the weight distribution myself. What is it? It's full time four wheel drive, or is there a transfer case and? Light? It's the same. It's the same um, drivetrain as uh, CJ2A. So early flat bender oh. Jeeps. Okay. T90 uh, three speed manual, and then a uh, Dana. Spicer model 18 at transfer mm-hmm. case, I think. Interesting. Oh, so parts are like reasonably available. Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. That's kind of awesome. See, this one, um, I, this one, my plan is to turn into a, a, an electric vehicle. I haven't decided yet if I'm going to make it a hybrid or a fully electric uh, a Jeep. And the only reason why I'm even considering hybrid is because this thing has a power takeoff mm-hmm. output which I could maybe use as an input for an electric motor. Um, Have you spoken to Bradley about this? Because you know his psychotic, what was once the once a Boxster project, right? Oh, that. Yeah. That. So you need a Nissan Leaf engine is what Bradley's getting at. Yeah. Oh, well, that's the plan anyway. That was <laughs> where I was going, but yeah. I like two A's. They look good too. This uh, the last time we had a conversation about this sent Chris down like a ten day rabbit hole of ooh electric conversions for everything. Let's do. Con- you know, here's the thing about electric conversions. You know, if you compare it to like a three fifty swap that everyone does, yeah, it's an entirely different. It's an entirely different process. It's it's not even in the same. It's really not in the same genre. A three fifty swap that is a wrenching endeavor. That is a mechanical right. yes. endeavor. An EV swap is an engineering endeavor. Yes. We're, 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 we're talking uh-huh. the difference between engineering and wrenching. They're not the same. Right. As I've, I, I, yeah, as I, I wrote a story a long time ago called Engineering, uh, Engineers Are Not Mechanics. 
<laughs> and oh, fuck. <laughs> yeah, seriously. That was that was more about like how people assume engineers know how to wrench when they don't. But right. it's a little, you know, not kind of an aside. But the point is like an EV swap is a, a hell of an ordeal. Yeah. Um, and I think, um, and I don't think it's, it, I think that's going to become, it's going to become really tricky keeping old cars on the road here. Mm-hmm. Not anytime soon, but in the distant future. So the, the thing that I always came back to is like, you end up spending about the same amount of money from like a, like an LS swap is like people say like 10 to 15, depending on like what you're doing. But when you go to an EV conversion, like you still end up spending about 10 to 15, but like part of that is just like trying to make software work. That's, that, that's not ever the case with an LS swap. Like that cost will come down a lot in the next like five to 10 years. I also don't know how you're spending 15 grand on an LS swap. <laughs> well, I agree with that. If it like an LS three with like, you know, a TR sixty six. That, that was maybe. the ball. The ballpark with all the Land Cruiser guys was like ten to twelve on. If you were looking at doing an LS into your eighty series, into an eighty, yeah, okay, yeah. that's okay. an eighty. If you're doing an LS into, you know, a, I will like yield a, to your expertise, Chris. <laughs> like, thank you. I didn't actually do any of the swap. It was. <laughs> I was like, oh, the cost of a new vehicle just to put a different engine in this one that's perfectly working right now. I'm out. Well, you could also just send a Jonathan Ward and just add three zeros to the end of that. So everything's fun. Someone else who hasn't returned my emails. <laughs> oh, <man. laughs> this is a fun show tonight. This is <laughs> talking about all damn. the things where I'm. Sucking. This is a little bit of salt coming out Just here. Just dunking on our. Uh, We're real people. Here. <laughs> yeah. Well. Oh man, dude, it's been a long time since I sent him an email. It's fine. He doesn't know who we are. Probably it's all right. Yeah, like the early days. I can we'll, tell you. We'll circle, we'll circle back. We don't need to circle back. <laughs> uh okay. Oh man, where should we go? So, uh, uh, I want to talk about minivans. That's, I mean, absolutely. <laughs> Is that a question? Yeah, sure. Of course. Where, where do you want to go? Okay, I, well, I, so here's my favorite part. I have four kids, and I don't own a minivan. You okay, do, let's talk. Let's talk about this. Let's talk about this. <laughs> this is a dilemma that I'm I'm not facing because I'm single, but I, I am anticipating a dilemma in the future. Okay. Okay. Let's just say, hypothetically, you have kids, you know, your typical two and a half kids or whatever. And uh, 2.375. I love love half a kid. Um, Which half? The one you don't feed. And you you have (laughs) statistical Uh, two and a half. Um, And you have a classic car. Let's just say, so I only drive old cars. And I have the great, you know, even my minivan is from 94. Diesel manual, Chrysler Voyager, my beauty. Oh, so good. All right. Let's just say all of a sudden, okay, you have kids now. And it's like, how can you possibly justify in your head in any way? I want to continue driving old cars, despite knowing that I know, I know it's not the safest option. Like, that would be great to, to, to take kids around it, right? I, but, my parents took me around in a 94 yeah, minivan. Exactly. But in in the modern era, so you, you know. Is it? Chris, you, you have kids, right? Yeah, I have four of them. Okay, walk me through this, okay? Let's just say you love this van. You, you think it'd be great to take kids around. But you know in the back of your head that it's not the safest van. It's right. not modern. It's not safe. So it just doesn't work, right? It's just you can't do it, I assume, huh? Um, the, it depends on the age of the kids. Um, we because 2001. How does that have any? It does because <laughs> when they get older, it's it's not as important. <laughs> if, if, when they get a little bit older, if they get to a booster seat, the the seat belt technology in this isn't that different than the seat belt. I mean, I'm sure modern seat belts well, are the, actually much the more advanced. Crash like, structure technology is quite a bit different. Crash structure is different. All the <laughs> no yeah, side airbags. Oh, you're yeah. 12. It's your choice to get into the van. Exactly. Take your but own risk. This, this at least probably <laughs> yeah. does this you have a driver's school, <laughs> It does. This actually, um, this might have been the first Chrysler. This was the very first Chrysler product with an airbag. See, I'm, my, oh, wow. my mom, my mom had a Dodge Caravan SE, which was like the sporty edition, right? It had the the five spoke sport edition? minivan uh, alloys or whatever. <laughs> but like, that's that's one of the things I learned to drive on. Um, 2001 was standardized latch systems in in anything that wasn't considered like commercial. So like the Ford Excursion was made in 2001, but it, because that's considered like 
super duties and commercial use, they didn't have to have the latch system for car seats in it. Um, so like that was always the year of going back to stuff. Like when I would look at old driving old stuff, it had to be newer than 2001. Cause we still have one kid that uses the car seat that has to latch into that stuff. Um, so like once your kids are like to using boosters, it's really not that big a deal. Like, I mean, we're, cars aren't running into people constantly. You're right. It does happen. Right. But it's not every day you're going to get an accident. I right. think it's okay. Hopefully, hopefully not every day. So, so it's possible. Is it? So it's possible to, 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 to go through the logic yeah. and be like, you know what? We're going to drive the kids in this old vehicle because it's awesome. Yes. Like, so we, we had a 94 Land Cruiser that for a long time, that was my daily and eventually like we we kind of talked ourselves out of it and we had to move on from it because of it didn't even have an airbag for me which i think it's hilarious that the chrysler and dodge minivans had airbags but the toyota land cruiser in 1994 did not have an airbag wow so so, so this one having all their time and money getting ready for the hundred yeah that's true yeah these started having airbags in 91 as standard equipment and okay it might not have been the very first chrysler product having a standard but all minivans starting in 91 and then this one might even have dual airbags by 94. Okay. For, for the front passenger as well? Yeah. Can't remember if mom's did or not. Where is this? So this is in, it's the island of Rügen in northern Germany. Okay. I don't even Can know. Can you spell that, that for those who love to Google map? Uh, Rügen, R U with an umlaut, G E N. <laughs> Difficult to type, but. Or you can say R U E G E N. I'm an umlaut man myself. That's an option. Umlaut is that man. is that command option? You uh. yes. It's uh, it's insert special characters. Uh, I think it is command option. Yeah, command shift U. Oh, it's option. Very much north northeast Germany. Like yes, almost actually Poland. What also the reason why I was there is uh, that's where uh, the um, Colossus of Prora is. Uh, that is the um, uh, enormous vacation destination that the Nazis built in the 30s as part of their KDF program. Oh, my gosh. I remember this thing. This is and the that, worst that I've ever even heard of this. So, so this, the KDF program is actually what got the Volkswagen into existence. So yeah. in the oh. 30s, Germany was promising citizens cars. If you just bought into this like stamp system. Uh, eventually you'd get enough stamps and you'd end up with your own Volkswagen. You could go on the Autobahn, which was then new, and go to Prora and go vacation on the beach. Um, anyway, that whole Kraft Durchfrode organization was total garbage. Nobody, no one ever got their Beatles, and the stupid vacation in the destination was never fi finished. So you just have these huge buildings it's like miles long just yeah, sitting I, right along the beach what abandoned. i have here ross is a rendering this is it it's a rendering. does not yeah. look like this in it's real life these are crap. abandoned yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's just rubble basically well it's I not rubble it's still standing. more fun at first it's beautiful on, up there though i'm on street view it's like mildly ominous yeah some uh, some Chernobyl vibes from the far well, from home podcast it's really <laughs> just the, it's really just the scale that that makes it yeah, it sort of makes it all kind of eerie. Yeah, right. it's, it's like a really long building. Yeah. Yeah, that's scale is something that the off road and the four wheel drive world gives us access to and like reference for that you kind of lose in, you know, day to day life. Like, I'm sure you guys have been somewhere where you're like, holy shit, that is a fucking mountain, you know, I mean, versus do like. Pulling a it's so uh, hacky, but like the Grand Canyon. Yes, you were there like, like almost this time last year, like uh, give or take. Yeah, sure. We'll go with that. Yeah, Your we'll dates are not accurate at all, but it's completely fine. It was um, a few months. It was fine. <laughs> but no, but like even how many times you've seen the Grand Canyon movies and videos? Like all the time. And then you yeah. still walk up to the edge of it and you're like, holy fuck, this thing or goes you forever. Walk to the yeah. bottom of a hill at an off-road park that you've seen on a video 500 times and you're like, Oh, that's how far up that well, single well, rock is. Well, that's because off-road videos, man. That the, the biggest flaw of off-road videos is you never truly <laughs> understand how steep something is, yes. how uh -huh. grand something is. Like yes. that yep. is 
I, you know, you almost have to add a little angle when you when you film it by just tweaking the, you know, turning the yes. camera a little bit. Yeah, yeah but the problem is if you know what you're looking for. The trees. At, you know yeah. The trees are yeah. kind of yeah. Exactly, yeah. right. The problem is it's like it, it either looks like you're going up a flat grade or the trees are crooked. It's like we right. can't win. There is no in-between for a, a video on the internet for off-roading. It is either flat or it is rolling over backwards. Exactly. Okay, I'm, I am now going to share... I have hey. taken videos before that I was like, I got to the top and was like, I'm gonna die, you know. Oh, and I saw then, this. You have exactly. to exactly. You have to turn the yep. screen to really. <laughs> exactly, it's the yeah, Casey Curry video that got out. Yep. That it was like somebody had twisted the camera and it looks like he's just driving straight up a hill. When in reality, like it's from it's above, basically. Yeah. Yeah. It's basically from above. It looks. It's like, such yeah. a fucking fallacy. So. It's it's pretty funny. Yeah. To me, that was I, like the, the hacky one. Did you guys ever? Did you guys watch a lot of? off-road videos when you were kids yeah rick russell well the youtube didn't exist when i was a kid so i had vhs's with oh, okay Paul. i did like not. Uh, there was this dude named rick russell that made these jeep videos before anybody t- was making jeep videos mine was probably like wide world of sports Easter, chris <laughs> like east africa safari stuff like, <laughs> you're t- youtube didn't exist when you were younger man no. How is that possible? Well, like, what what have I been doing to myself here? It's all these, <laughs> all those late nights of, of renting have really got to me. Damn, this is where we truly discover that our last names are in no way, shape, no, or dude. Related. Genetics are definitely. Oh, yeah, I got the short end of the stick. <laughs> was establishing that there is no relation. That just clearly not. My cousin David all the time. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you oh guys man, totally could have played it off as like coming from alternate universes. Sure, yeah, I would absolutely. be the older one. I think. <laughs> I, I I will say I used to watch YouTube videos like a, a, an alarming amount, like yeah. to the point where it was just kind of socially odd. Like like um, some sometimes I'd hang out with friends at, like at their place and uh, you know you'd go on. What did you do on the internet in oh, two thousand and seven, two thousand eight? You just I don't know. MySpace, hot or not, not I don't know. Um, <laughs> Ross, Ross was in high school then. Uh-huh. <laughs> but yeah, like that uh, was like the time AIM when. And there was a certain selection of websites. I God, I'd already been working for like five years by that time. <laughs> so that, um, uh, yeah, I remember I, YouTube was coming around and then there was, there were plenty of other streaming like Yahoo video and whatnot. And I would say since for the past, okay, 2007, 15 years, I have been watching off-road videos like almost constantly. And actually, you know, for the, there's actually value in watching off-road videos on YouTube. Like, for, like real, like I can, when I go off-roading, I can look, I can look at an obstacle. I can look at a vehicle and I could say yes or no, if it'll make it. <laughs> and, and I can say exactly what the line is. Oh, I can literally really? say, here's the line and here's how you have to. Balance your momentum to get up it. If you've got open diffs, you got to sort of right at the last and second. Like wheelbase truck goes which to, right. which line is for which like whether it's a two door Jeep or you know a fucking right exactly car. right exactly. It's the same thing that people who watch videos or do sim racing for sports cars get from virtual reality that we get you know in saying okay so those two rocks or those like moguls or that log and that like right step are this far apart how do you set up for that you know there is actually you're a thousand percent right there's real value in that especially when you know the internet is right in front of you all the time and you only get to wheel once every month if you're lucky but you only you especially notice that there's value in it when you go off-roading with people who um you know who haven't done it before you know, and they'll, yes. they'll, t- they'll take a line in their two-door TJ and um, you'll, you'll realize, okay, you're going to get, your wheelbase is too short. You're going to get hung up. You have to go, you, have, you know, novices don't have that intuition. Not at um, all, yeah. And that's like, honestly, when it comes to off-roading, skill, I mean, this is obvious, but like. Experience and skill. Skill is really important. I mean, unless yeah, you've like, got dude, like a, yeah. Even the, like bow waves. Just judging yeah. what kind of stuff yes. to go into a, a right. mud pit or a small pond or a water crossing, you know, how much momentum and how much actual, like, you can, because you can adjust how much water is pushed in front of you. But, yeah. Dude, yeah. Momentum, I, mean, I feel like. The understanding of momentum. Yes. 
that's is so the important. biggest thing ever. Absolutely. That, that, that was my TJ. Like yeah. that's open diffs, stock <laughs> tires. I made it up that hill where the guy in front of me with 33s. That was your TJ. Yeah, that was mine years ago. Yeah, when you know Ross what's was still a baby in high school. I was doing that <laughs> as a yeah. working professional. I was on the uh, wow on spoken websites. <laughs> so, so that yeah, I mean, understanding momentum is is like it's 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 funny because when you apply power, is so important. You know, yes. you know, like okay, you you have an open diff vehicle and you have an obstacle. Okay, you have to hit it with momentum. So, so the average person is like, okay, then I'll just go pedal down right away. No, you don't do that. You approach yeah. slowly. And you bump it exactly the right time, but yeah. you don't, you don't let it hop. It, it's like it's such a precise art that like, you just, I don't know how to teach it. You just, you just have to, it's, I don't it's know. It's almost a feel. You have to have the feel it is. for yes. it. Yes. And, and you can is, only get it through reps. A thousand per- percent yeah. where I will maintain to the end of my life that an ATV is the perfect way to learn this. Because what you learn from a smaller vehicle with lower weight that is much more influenced by your actual inputs, it translates perfectly. I could see that. To yeah. a bigger vehicle. You know, I, I no. learned everything from quads that I translated to trucks. I, I, I could totally see that. The only, the only thing that I, I could see, you might get a false sense of security because on an ATV, you've got so little weight. That maybe you can hop that rear end on a, on a rock and not um, have to worry about an axle shaft snap, snapping. No, no, he'll break them. <laughs> oh, <okay>. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I've only broken axles on quads. I haven't not gone broken axles in trucks. So right, okay, all right. That's but what when he, when he was saying quads, I said yeah. you break it. No, I didn't say all, anything about fairness, your truck. You also don't learn mechanical sympathy from ATVs. That's which, true. If, uh, if you're driving, because they're toys, they're strictly toys. Yeah, you break, you can break you're going to have the 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 <laughs> yeah. tow it home. But how to approach an obstacle? Absolutely, I could totally yeah. see that. Yeah, and how uh, you know power application at certain times, and how wheelbase plays in, and mm-hmm. wheel tire placement, and all that. You know, I, I would say there are certain things that, like, you know, people like us, we've gone off roading, so it, it's obvious. But sometimes when I go off roading with someone new. And there's like a big rock and they're just like, okay, I'll just straddle it and I probably won't hit it. I'm like, no, you don't do that. But like, <laughs> oh, I get yeah. that. But, <laughs> but, yeah. but I get, I, I, your territory. I never thought, <laughs> I never thought of like why, you know, at this point, cause I'm so like, I'm in too deep. I'm like, no, you wouldn't do it. But that, you think about it, you're like, yeah, why would you want to hit a rock? You know, you just exactly. like the average person, like, you know, just not sure. hit that, you know? So, um, so in the, uh, ATV rider and UTV driver Slack channel over the last like two weeks, we've been going on this rabbit hole of there's this place somewhere in the UK. I don't know where it is. And there's this water crossing and it floods like crazy when it rains. And it's just people taking videos of, of like pedestrians in, you know, normal cars going in fucking full speed Oh, that's in England, right? Is yeah, it, yeah. I think it's in England. It's I've been watching that something. Yes, I've been watching that, but I never understand why don't they just warn the people? That's a very great question. Wait, but where this do you is think it is like it's the something Ford. Great Britain somewhere. Uh, I can't. Uh, I, you just I YouTube it; it'll pop right up. Um, that's the problem is I can't play YouTube though. But you're gonna be on YouTube with the video. To what you're saying oh, about right. it's like, like the not you know the the mentality of people who have the, you know, off-road mindset and deep water crossings do play into that in some capacity. Oh yeah. Um, just versus, hit it. <laughs> versus those who have like no understanding of anything mechanical and you know, that water and fire don't really jive. Um, you know, I have to say water has been where I've made my biggest mistakes off-road actually they weren't mistakes is it a mistake if you know it's probably going to go poorly but you don't care that much um Um, no uh, well i'm not going to say it's a mistake because i've also done the similar thing where driving in the river i knew eventually we were going to get stuck yeah but you got towed out and the truck lived and you finished the trip i think a mistake is only something that you knowingly decide to like avoid you know, better sanity. 
So there are two things I did with water. Uh, one of my XJ, I straight up hydrolocked it, uh, blew the, the rods out of the oil pan. That one, that one was actually a straight up mistake because I, I was on the very edge of this big puddle uh, south, somewhere south of, south of Detroit. I forgot what the off-road park is. Um, and then uh, I got sucked in. I, I, my driver's side front tire hit a deep hole and it sucked me right into the center of it. And I was at pretty heavy throttle and it was over. Like it was so fast. Like I didn't even know what hit me. I was just like, what just happened? And yeah. Blew up Were you the over. first to go through it or? Yeah. Like, yeah. I was oh, just okay. through it. See, I, I'm a big sucker for the state test. It is. If anyone is searching for this in the UK, it's Rufford, R-U-F-F-O-R-D Lane. And if you look up Rufford Lane Water Fails, you have hours Hundreds. of YouTube They're fun. Enjoy. Yeah. Enjoy. They, they number those videos. There's like number 58. And th this um, one is very, very calm that I'm going to share the image of because there's a Land Rover. It looks like an oh, LR. What is that little thing right there? Two. An LR2, or what, what, that was the Freelander for us, wasn't it? It was. Well, it was what the Freelander became. I don't know. More what importantly, that red thing what's used the cute little be. red car? I don't know. That's a a Renault car. hatch. I, it's incredible. Because that looks like a Kia Soul shaped thing behind it. That is, yeah, it's a soul back there. Hmm. Definitely. Okay, you know, look at, talk but look at the two ladies on the left just looking. They're just watching. <laughs> they? Oh, look at the fish. Yeah, oh, and yeah, there look. Are. They're trying to get their. They're trying to get clicks, man. They got their YouTube yeah. channel. <laughs> they got their TikToks. Oh, how many? Uh, how many XJs have you had? Um, uh, I don't know, six, <laughs> five or six. Five or six. Do you still have the ZJ with the stick? Um, I have currently. I have two and a half uh, ZJs with sticks. It's gonna two be well. One's a parts car, so it's really just two. Okay. Was a yeah, I, in the water. Those, yeah. We should talk about water fording real quick. Specifically, we should talk about how automakers go about mitigating uh, potential hydrolox situations. Like, you see, with Mercedes, they have like a special valve um, that they can close so that you can start to pull air from a different. You can have basically different in intake options. Uh, you can have, of course, just a high mounted intake. But I remember on JL, the big thing was like, let's come up with a torturous path mm -hmm. so that if water gets in, it basically gets separated out by this tortuous path. Oh, I remember that. Is this the, this isn't the new intake that they were talking this about on the 392? No, the 392. Mm. It I wasn't was thinking that. from the get-go. There was a, like an air-water separator kind of thing. It's like sort of just makes... snorkel sorts. It's just it just makes so, makes it so that there's some some path that the air water mixture has to go through that would basically the water would hit some wall and fall to the bottom before it would get you know sucked all the way in. Um, yeah, there are lots of different ways of doing it. Uh, I think the Land Rover Discovery has like a. I think I did a video on Jalopnik. The of current the, the, disco. The current disco. I think it takes in air through the hood. I think there are like two hood, like in, the intake, something with the hood. Hmm. Anyway, man. I don't remember. Happened. I put like 500 miles on a disco last summer and uh, didn't get it wet. So I can't speak to it. <laughs> well, and every time I talk about Land Rover Discoveries, I talk about my friends leaking right above the steering wheel. What yeah. year is it? Uh, 20. Ooh. Question uh, Call Volvo. See what is, they say about their 2017 and 2016 XC90s. You know what? I got to say, the Discovery is a pretty unloved Land Rover among most people I talk to. It, uh, I think I, the one that I had was a pre pro model that had gone through some testing. Uh, is, it, is it unloved because looks are subjective and most people think it isn't? that great i think it's fine i mean i think yeah, it's i don't, I don't I mean, think the, it's the bad the but back just... doesn't bother me like but we the thing is the three of us know the lineage you know yeah yeah right when um, you compare it to where it came from i'm like no like i that what, should what have been I... called lr5 though and the defender should have been called discovery 
One of my closest off roading friends loves Land Rover Discoveries, but he, he his love kind of stops in like the early 2000s oh, when Discovery. they still oh god, were, once were they time, LR4s. Once upon a time, no, LR4 was like 2014. Uh, but I once upon a time I drove one of the V8 Discoveries with the five speed manual, and it was so good, it was mm. like horrible, but so good. <laughs> yeah. they're also not great for tall people as tall as that truck is to be tall and drive a discovery is not great so Again, where are we at I don't have that you two guys unibody or body on frame for off-road vehicles where are we at mm. because oh. you, you're talking about a body on frame really tall vehicle yeah. not a lot of height why because let's be honest the body sits on top of the frame it depends on what kind of off road and what your ultimate goal is with the vehicle, you know? Okay, cuz I, I mentioned this because I'm building an overlanding vehicle right now. Um, okay. I'm building it for cross world travel, okay. you know, D Dan Greck type stuff. You guys follow Dan Greck at all? We he's, had him on the show he's, twice. He's friend of the show. Yeah, he's been on the show. Friend twice. of the show, Dan Greck. Yeah. I talked Dude, to him. Dude's the man. He's the man. Regularly. Yeah, he's, he's a great guy. We love him. And yeah. Yeah, Bye. as do I. As do I. I've edited some of his stuff. He's great. I, anyway. I feel like for something for something that's like across the world, body on frame, I think would be better. Because isn't that what most of they are? Like Land Cruisers are body on frame. But, but does that make them better? You can do across the world without needing ultimate articulation or you know, L little red ability, from though. dust to glory went from British Columbia to the southern tip of yeah. But you could get a body on frame. You could you could do the whole thing in a WK2 Grand Cherokee if you want. It, I would, I would, you know, are the yeah. I think Chris. I think body on frame is a in some ways I would lean that direction because of you know you look at some of the, the mods that Dan does to his cars. He he adds like water tanks and stuff. Yeah, he of adds course. you know components underneath. It is hard to create provisions on a unibody chassis like you can to a frame. You just weld a tab on there, drill yeah, some holes. Exactly. You can put yep. all sorts of stuff on a frame, which is great. As soon as you start welding and drilling holes into a unibody, it's just like, where do you put it? Where's the structure really? Are we flexing floors now? Like, yeah, you're where that is that structure? Does it actually go? Yeah, and I, I've also yeah. found like, like this last weekend, also, if I'm talking too much, I don't know how this works. Am I supposed to talk a lot? Yeah, yeah. you talk however the fuck much you want. Go ahead. Okay. You can also cuss. Right. <laughs> we got to uh, the very end of the show with KJ and stop recording and he cussed. And I was God. like, you could have been doing that the whole time. I thought you just did more than that. Wow. Guy. You know, I've, I used to not cuss at all. And then 2020 just beat me down. <laughs> you know, these last few years. I'm trying, I'm trying to help people cope. It does. It's a nice it's little stress. There are studies. Words are meant to be used. That's right. You know what I – so this last weekend, I, uh, I was installing a, uh, a transmission into a, a ZJ, the, the vehicle that I'm planning on taking on this overlanding trip. The previous owner – so this guy, uh, his name is Dustin. He owned this five-speed manual Grand Cherokee. He drove it all the time. He loved it. And he saw that I had written some article about five-speed ZJs because I'm obsessed. And he's like, dude, you should check mine out. It's up here in Wisconsin. So I drove to Wisconsin, 10 hours or six hours, whatever. Saw his Jeep completely roached, just completely toast. Anyway, as luck would have it, like three years would pass and he would call me the same week. So this one is not, <laughs> strangely, this one's not it. <laughs> Actually, this is not either of the two I'm about to talk about. This is a third one. So we've oh, established well, how many XJs you've had. How many well, ZJs have you had? I've had four five-speed ZJs. Four let's talk five? about – yes, let's talk about this one here. This one, 125,000 miles from Reno, five-speed, four-liter, clean as a whistle. The right color. But anyway, it's too nice for me to it's beat up nice off the record. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so, so Dustin – so three years after I see his Jeep, he calls me. He's like, I'm taking it to the junkyard, man. I'm like, dang, that sucks. That same week, a guy in Virginia messages me on Facebook, uh, something on Facebook. He had read one of my articles. He's like, hey, man, I've got a, uh, 
a red uh, Jeep Grand Cherokee. Used to have the five speed, but I yanked the transmission out. I'm taking it to the junkyard. And I'm like, what? We have a rust free, nice body from Virginia. And we have a rust free, complete ZJ from Wisconsin. I had no choice. So I've been merging the two into my overlanding rig. <laughs> it, for both of them oh, combined, that's like obligatory. I spent 700 bucks on both of them combined. Oh my God. Is it, is it with Torchinsky? Is that the, is this the oh, right ZJ? This now? is it. This, oh, this is it. Here it is. I bought this thing 250 bucks plus 100 for the transfer case Which out of a Virginia um, uh, lumber yard. That's this is the vehicle I'm going to take around the world right here. And, I, I, uh, I, I would, I would that's like, the vehicle you're going to take around the world. Oh, oh, what's that supposed to mean, Ross? And there's what's parked? What, what would do what's the towing, towing it? What right towing now? it? What, yeah, that's the well, question. here's the thing about the Land Cruiser. Uh huh. <laughs> it's boring as hell. It's yes. boring. It's boring. Yeah, but and it looks it. This Ross, you're, you're forgetting. You're forgetting Look, what we learned when we talked to the Mongo Rally people. You don't take the thing that's going to work all the time. You take the thing that's going to break down. So you actually get to experience it, the places you're going and meet people and have fun and get in, into the culture. Uh -huh. You just have to put Mongo Rally stickers on it and then everybody welcomes you. Start I got a hot take. And hot masochist. Here's, yes. a, here's a hot take. <laughs> Correct. I, want to I, think, a hot take. I think a five speed ZJ, when new, is as reliable. As a, an LX470 when new. If you drove them and maintained them the same, they would both Probably. last until the end of time. Yeah. yeah. I think the difference is the Lexus is an $80,000 car that gets maintained very well. In the case of this one here, it was owned by someone who had plenty of money to pay for maintenance. And the Grand Cherokee, this one, especially a base model, they were beaten on hard. But four liter engine, really good. AX15 transmission, really good. And oh, it is an AX15. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, I mean, that'll outlive the cockroaches. But you're right about the Land Cruiser. I have to say, it's funny. It was the very first Toyota I ever bought, and it lived up exactly to what everyone said it would. They're like, it will never break. I'm like, what do you mean it'll never break? I haven't even seen this thing yet. I bought it sight unseen. I'm about to tow 5,000 pounds across the country. The first thing, that's the first thing I'm going to do, and you're, you're going to tell me it's not going to break? Didn't break. Didn't even almost break. Yep. Didn't even uh, almost break. <laughs> I just found a 95 ZJ. It's a 5.2 with a five speed. They have some swaps. 18,000. Go for it. Ah, someone did a swap on that. Oh, it, it's like perfect. It's... Oh, really? Is so, it, does it look stock? It's perfect. Like, it is. Wow. Perfect. It's got Rubicon Mob wheels. Like, so do you, do, you, do you have an, a plan for your trip or is it just we're going to build first and then we will go? Um, the plan is developing. Okay. Uh, <laughs> it is definitely build first. Okay. Right now, it's like making plans right now in the, in the middle of a pandemic is completely pointless. Yeah. Um, uh, throw them out the window. Make all yeah. the plans you want I mean, and then start over tomorrow. You can't but, go but north I have goals, of the border though. this summer, at least. Like, Yeah, I have goals. I, 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 I want to do a, a trip all the way down to Argentina. Mm. Um, and then... I do want to do the entire length of Africa at some point. Um, okay. the, the idea was inspired by uh, a friend of mine named Peter from Belgium, whom I had met in the summer of 2020 while driving around in my diesel van. He invited me to his place and we were just hanging out in Belgium. And he was like, let me show you my trip that I took in a Toyota. <clears throat> um, all the way down the entire length of Africa with my friends. It took him six months. And I saw that. I was like, I never thought this was like part of me thought maybe it was possible, but like extremely improbable. This dude mm -hmm. bought a Toyota uh, Hilux for like, I don't know, 6,000 euros, <laughs> got three of his friends together and just spent six months driving the entire length of Africa. And that sounds that's and like, yeah, he had a differential go out or whatever, like because he didn't do anything. Here's the thing about my Jeep. I'm going to replace everything on it because the parts are cheap and I can do it anyway. But like he just bought this Hilux and just – I would never, ever, ever do that. Just buy a car and drive Dude. it? No way. Like I, I've had second doubts about driving something I bought in New Jersey home. You know? <laughs> like, <laughs> like, well, you, that's, smart, that's a smart instinct. <laughs> but isn't that, 
<laughs> there were bridges to go over. <laughs> I think that's like car enthusiasts. I don't want to say Mecca, but like that's right of one of the goals is buy something, fly in, drive it home. Like, yeah, but not the entire length of Africa. No, no, no. no. That's uh, Defl- uh, dri- drive unless, it home. Sure. Unless Check you can get, oh, what was that guy who did the, and like an 80s slash uh, Hilux? Carl, I think his name is. Oh, hold on. I'm, I'm Googling. Okay. I want your opinions on, on the ZJ as an overlanding vehicle. Cause I ask because it is a very, uncommon base for overlanding builds are you planning to sleep sleep in it yes in it and in it i'm not a people are is it going to house it will house me just you just me uh there will be that no fine. okay hold back seats um, sorry all right I, i'm, I'm gonna have to create a spare tire history. carrier in the back <clears throat> so this is this is, his name is carl muth he's i think he's an economist but like while he was living in africa he took a Hilux and put an 80 series front end on it. Uh, huh. And I, I love Hilux? this truck. Do what? Wow. That looks like it started as a second gen Tacoma or third gen Tacoma. Sorry. I'm pretty sure it was a Hilux. So I'll Definitely stop my a, share and see what else I can find. Must have had the same window. But uh, the ZJ is deeply underappreciated in the four wheel drive community because I it think, is. you know, part of visibility these days is like social media and youtube and everything but we grew up with zjs as everyday vehicles like the mundane you know totally. mom and dad's like fancy car uh, my parents had two of them when i was a kid and it's like they kind of they faded into the background they did totally. and you know they don't you don't look back on on that the same way you look back on like, you know, what was concurrent with it in the four wheel drive world in the nineties, like defenders, you know, like there's just not the same mentality towards them. Um, I mean, people have built them though. Yeah, and and uh, the thing is, like, it's the right size. Yeah. So. Okay, allow me to, to defend a, uh, a hot take here. I think the five-speed manual Jeep Grand Cherokee, the rare one of 1,400, is the best budget overlanding, via, uh, overlanding Jeep currently in existence. Budget overlanding Jeep currently in existence. I'll the disagree budget, with that. Um, okay, okay, I knew you would. <clears throat> but yeah. let's, go, let's go through it. Okay, I have to say. Okay. What's my point? What is what budget? What dollar figures are we talking here? Because we're I, talking, I, we're talking five like five grand. Yeah. Um, WJ with a four liter and a thousand dollars suspension. Transmissions were garbage on WJs. <laughs> they were, but you can probably find one for four grand that has already had the transmission replaced. Just man, I would never trust the Chrysler Automatic. No, I wouldn't. <laughs> I, I just wouldn't. I but would have himself out of his own point. Uh, you know what though? You know what though? I'd be like triple A on speed dial. <laughs> you know what, Ross? I saw today. I was driving. <laughs> I was driving through the canyons today here in like the LA area, and I saw a WJ. And is it just me? Are are those just getting better looking now? I don't know. I, I'm really into WJs now. All of a sudden, those are the curvier ones, right? The curvier yeah. ones. The is fast lane truck. Oh. The fast lane truck bought one. Wait, Ooh, they're starting to look good. Oh, two, oh no, 99 to 04. 99 yeah. to 04. That, that was um, the uh, concurrent. So when I bought my 04 Wrangler, it wasn't ready yet. And they gave me uh, a WJ for like a long weekend. Oh, yeah. And the amount of gas I went through. Oh, was that 478 weekend, then? Oh, my yeah, God. Definitely. It was so much gas. Like, just, <laughs> I was like, nice. I think I. Like I owed them money. Like I refilled it like two or three times in a weekend. Like just, yeah. That's hilarious. Yeah. Florida <laughs> interstate. Um, they, once upon a time in a, in a universe a long time ago, uh, my friend Dan and I went out on Lime Rocks infield autocross track on his <laughs> LEJ. <laughs> and it was so fucking fun. Mm. Oh. There were like bowling balls floating around in that, but <clears throat> yeah, you're lucky you're not dead. Yeah. Okay. Other Jeeps that are better overlanding, budget overlanding vehicles than a, a ZJ stick shift. 
The XJ comes close, but they're getting they're a little smaller. They don't ride quite as well. Now for one that isn't going to put your feet through and Fred Flintstone it. I'm pro Flintstone. <laughs> uh, they're just a little bit smaller, and um, uh, they don't you know they don't quite ride as well. But yeah, and they cost a little bit more. But it's more or less a wash for the XJ. No, just, that's it. That's it. Like. Um, TJs are getting are too small. LJs are expensive. Yeah. So are LJs what? are astronomically it, expensive. It has to be a Jeep. Well, there are lots better offered uh, over. Yeah, no, we're, we're Chris. We've like, done we have to narrow it. To, we have to narrow it to right Jeep for this for the CJ um, to be remotely relevant in this space. To be, to be under five thousand dollars for overlanding, like you could probably find. A uh, Montero, miles Montero is where I was going. Yeah, Montero, Montero would be fantastic. That's a different story. That's off brand. <laughs> it's not brand. My my uh my coworker Andrew, he exactly. let me drive. He let me drive his ninety eight Montero. I think ninety eight is it or two thousand uh, two thousand maybe wide body locker. Would that be a two thousand? I'm not uh, sure. locker. Anyway, he let me drive th- that thing across the country, and I love it. I mean that Montero is just, whoo! They look so good with the wide bot with the, you know, the fenders and the quarters. Oh, I need to get his with the stickers though. I know Chris, he's got stickers. I, I sent you the yes. picture of of the guy that's uh, the owner of the shop that's working on the Lexus. His Montero. You sent it in Slack. That's gonna take me oh, a minute wow. to dig because I don't have Ooh, Slack open. On the look computer. at this no, thing! Sorry. It's freaking epic. <clears throat> so the and the only reason I went to this is, and I in in the. The Jeeps will fit normal size human. This would allow me to sleep in it. Mm-hmm. I'm, I I'm, I'm not normal sized. This thing is so awesome, man. It's got an ice and automatic transmission that will never die. Right. I hear the, I hear the engines are pretty good, if a little bit underpowered. Well, and isn't this is more like a, uh, a world vehicle? Like you, you should be able to find parts yes, of this in other exactly. Parts of the world. Now, the ZJ would be fantastic for South America because they built them in. Uh, an Argentina, no, 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 in Venezuela, and then another country somewhere in South America. But okay. outside of South America, Europe, and North America, forget about it. You can so, get some parts, XJ parts, though. Well, and that's like if if you break down. I'm sorry, when you break down, because it's <laughs> it. Well, it's not so much to to, to disparage the Jeep. It's just like it's a long trip. Stuff's gonna happen. Yeah, or or, or you could get into a crash or run into right. something, yeah. or or your parking or, brake could fail and all of a sudden right. an your animal decides that KU it, is it, on its, it's side. time to fix something. wants yeah. to die upon Damn. Your <laughs> right in kenya where that story is still great because it was like yeah, i'm in the middle of nowhere and people started showing up he's like how are people sh-? anyway but like it if you can get to a shop you you might have to spend a week yeah just waiting for something to get shipped to you like i don't i don't think it's an absolutely awful scenario i i think it's a viable option and that's what dan says a lot he's like guys like you can get shipments most places in the world. It might take some time, yeah. but just that's kind of the point. Enjoy yourself. Like you're, you're going to get, you can get your parts. Right. But Dan's also planning to run like the world's loneliest road across Australia. Yeah. You know, and like, Oh, in the gladiator. Yeah. 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 If you, if you hit, you know, something wild out there, you have to have some kind of Garmin in reach. Recourse. Like, mm. Not just that, but faith in the ability to get parts within a reasonable amount of time. And also, you know, an ambulance. Uh, yeah, Garmin and Reach. Garmin, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Garmin, if you're listening, answer my goddamn emails. They're like right down the street, man. All you got to do is to ask. From Dude, you? They, they employ yeah. half of Kansas City. World what? headquarters is like right here. I've sent three emails in that. Chris, Chris, that. do you know so anybody from your high school who went there? Bang on doors there for me. I don't, I don't know high school. It's my kids' classmates' parents all work there now. Please, <laughs> oh, please, please, dude. I, um, I, I, I can probably try to find a contact for that you. That would be yes. great because I have a trip in one month and three days for which we need some kind of navigational advice. Okay. Oh yeah, where are you going? Going to Moab. With the, I still love how you mispronounce it. Moab. Sorry. <laughs> I mean, honestly, you're probably more right than the rest of us. I know. Yeah. <laughs> it's, the, it's the New York accent. <laughs> Fucking Moab. Yeah, Fucking exactly. Moab. Yeah. Christ. Man, we uh, butchered names here in this country. It's hilarious. So we but, all do. Yeah, no, the UTV driver and ATV rider crew is going out to Moab. And uh, 
we just Jeff Henson thankfully just locked in a couple quads for us because Woo. Jeff and I are the only main contributors to ATV Rider, and uh, we have a Grizzly, and he just locked in the Scrambler One Thousand, which was All right. about seven hundred pounds and makes a quoted ninety horsepower. Oh well, okay. that good or bad? That sounds like a lot. It's a it's it, it makes ninety horsepower and it oh, out of a quad. It's, it's a it's a quad. That's a shit ton. Yeah, <laughs> I, I just sold a Scrambler eight fifty and it was fucking fast. And uh, and this makes fifty percent more horsepower. <laughs> I have cars. My F. Many of my cars make less power than that. Oh, I've owned <laughs> I've owned a bunch of vehicles that oh. that have weighed. 3,500 pounds or more and made less power than this squad. So, mm. yeah, so that's was, that's coming up quickly. Um, who were we? Scott was... Um, I'm going to send Scott an email, too. He had a different uh, navigation thing that he used from far from home. But it wasn't so much... You, are you guys looking for dire, like an actual like turn-by-turn turn directional stuff that you no, could program? No, 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 no. We, or, we got, like, we're fucking in the middle of nowhere, hit a button. I don't know how to answer that i don't know either <laughs> yeah I, I don't know how to answer that okay we'll talk about it later there's a good chance i'm just gonna steal my brother's um oh god i can't i'm, I'm never gonna remember remember what he has because I, I feel like that's some sure. andrew collins advice there is yeah. uh buy <clears throat> the refurbished ones he told us to buy refurbished in reaches yeah hmm. yeah i'm just gonna my brother's got like a little like you know digital thing. I'm just gonna steal it. It's fine. So there are other map companies too. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not leading. I like I'm along for right? the ride on this. Usually when we go on trips, I'm like, oh well, I don't know where the fuck we're going. So well, that's the best part. Like, David, we talked to the guys from Express Rally who do their adventure series. And the best thing about that is showing up and not giving a shit about where you're going. Mm. They map it. They feed you. All you have to do is drive and camp, basically. Like, it's pricey, but it seems worth it. Yeah. Mm. yeah how yeah. do you plan to uh, to do the, the mapping on your worldly trip? I mean, you know, I, 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 don't, I have to say, when I travel, I have general destinations and it's not so. So this past summer, I drove from Germany to Turkey, which was way far than I thought it would be. To, <laughs> I, a friend of mine jokingly messaged me. He's like, "Hey, uh, just letting you know, if you want to come to Turkey, uh, the wedding's next week." And I'm like, "Dude, I'm in Germany. That's like not that far." It, and I, I I checked it out on maps. It was like 12 hours or 20. It was 20 hours, maybe. Yeah, 20 hours. I'm like, 20 hours ain't shit. I've done 20 hours. That's like from Detroit to like Denver or something, whatever. No problem. So I got into my minivan, drove east, and turns out, dude, those border crossings. I, we might have talked about this already last time. The border I don't think crossing, we did. Okay, you can go from Germany to Austria, no problem. Austria to Hungary? It was two or three days, right? It, that, that's, Germany to Austria is fine. Austria to Hungary, no problem. Once you start getting into Serbia and Bulgaria, and uh, yeah, uh, um, yeah, the the border out of Hungary, and then the then the Serbia Bulgaria, and then the Bulgaria Turkey, if I have that right, those border crossings were three hours each. Oh my gosh! In a hundred and five degree weather oh. at idle, I'm just <laughs> sitting in this AC less van, no air conditioning in this van. Oh. Oh. Not moving at all for three hours, like basically crawling for three hours in 105 degrees. Now the diesel van hung in there, great. But on the way back, on the way back, I stopped by um, Belgrade, Serbia. A reader had invited me to his house, so I hung out there. And he's like, "Dude, we gotta fix your AC." So we went <laughs> to some little tiny mechanic in Serbia, and for like twenty five dollars, AC fixed. So on the way back, it was great. Anyway, uh, so that was a, a long trip. It was like 30 plus hours to get one way to the wedding. And then I went even farther east toward Syria, oh. like five hours from, from Syria. Um, not a lot of planning, I have to say. Okay. Basically, there was no planning. Actually, zero. I just drove and slept in the van. 
yeah, uh, it bit me in the ass because I didn't realize the the, the uh, border crossings would be three hours <clears> each. <throat> but honestly, I kind of like the no planning thing. I mean, if you're going to do around the world, maybe zero planning will is a bad idea. But like, isn't that the beauty of life? Is like the the unpredictable. It. I don't know if it's like zero planning, but just like having your vehicle prepped. Like if you have your AC working, you have your heat. Oh, working. the vehicle will be on point. Yeah. I, at that point, like if you, as long as you have an internet connection, you can still work. Like, or at least have your your stuff planned far enough ahead. Like, yeah, we can take breaks. Like, that's the thing that uh, Richard Nasley from Best of Glory said. Like, once they were out on the road, like a day on the road was like seventy five dollars. Yep. So like that's how they knew they they okay. would budget. Like, and yep. and that was it. Like they gather money, they travel for a little bit, then they go gather money more and work. And this that's also great. that's great brought upon me a, a fantastic idea we should start an off the road again podcast map okay and when guests come on like david check the box for what countries they've been to you know, i think we could check a lot of the on. world right now <laughs> I, we could probably cover the majority of the world dan greg will decimate all well dan greg yeah dan, dan just Take the highlighter and colors in like entire <laughs> fucking yeah. hemispheres between Africa <laughs> and Australia. Dan, plus Jules in Australia. We've talked to Joel down there. Yep. He's traveled. Richard and Ashley. Richard and Ashley. Uh, that's BC, so South America. Cool. They're in Saudi Arabia yeah. right now. David's uh, covered like most of Europe. So. Well, and then <laughs> Scott doing the Mongol rally from London all the way out to Mongolia. I, like, I think we, this is something we need to put, we have to create a virtual. And he drove back through Russia to get back to Europe. So yeah, we're going to have to, we're going to have to do this. This could be fun. Robbie did yep. Iceland. Yep. We've got, and uh, Andy from Warren did uh, Alcan. So he's been, mm-hmm. I think we could really. This could be fun. Is mm-hmm. it fun or is it kind of sad that you and I haven't done as much? <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, question. Uh, so you mentioned someone from Warren. Yeah. Andy Lowenthal. Yep. My light just got better. Crank, yep. Crankshaft okay. culture. I was going to ask what your guys' thoughts are on winches in general for like an, an overlanding rig. Oh, so boy. the trip you're describing. So my, my general. So Ross has a winch that he's putting on his GX. I have traction boards for the Suburban. I have um, I've also had traction boards. For the trip you're describing, I think a winch would be very helpful because it sounds like at times you're going to be very solo. Invaluable mm. when you need it. Yeah. Right. I think also, I, also uh I, Ross, I'm a GX fan for the record. <laughs> I, I, oh, I yeah. helped I helped install a little folding table that comes off of the rear mm-hmm. swing gate. On the, on the door? Yeah. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It seems very, very GX of both. <laughs> It is. Oh, it's a- <laughs> it is. Um, we'll get you connected with Andy because he's a good dude, and I'm sure he'll he'll be kind to you. And uh, especially, oh, no, I, I already have a winch. I got it from. Oh. <laughs> it's a cheap eBay winch. I mean, and, we're gonna uh, connect you with Andy. No, no, no. <laughs> well, here's the thing about winches. Here's the thing about winches. You need them like three times, and this eBay one will work exactly three times. It's fine. Okay. okay. The thing is, those three times that you need it, the fourth time is when you really need. It. <laughs> <laughs> and you don't want it to have some kind of fucker. So it may, yeah. I for that kind of trip, I'd have both. I'd have winches and traction boards. Because uh what was the uh Lance from Earth Cruiser told the story of being uh solo in the Sahara. Yeah, and they were digging in a, the in a silt pit land with anchors. Zero zero uh tow points, right? Yeah. Or, or consistency of the soil, so he couldn't even land anchor. Mm-hmm. And they what? ended up, yeah, they ended they up dig a tra- hole? that they dug a hole. The traction boards, like nothing was working. The These interior carpets from their Earth Cruiser was allowing them just enough traction, and they were inching out. It took them like two days to get out. Oh, wait, so they, they put the carpets under the tires? Yes. Or they? Oh wow. Okay. Huh. It, like they put the Old traction school. boards under, and the truck shot them back, and the, he said you could see them ripple through the silt. Like the traction boards wouldn't catch, they wouldn't hold against the silt on the bottom. Like, yeah, I think that's it was amazing. It was you know, nuts. I, I always thought that in that scenario, I would grab a shovel, try to dig like five feet, and I would bury my spare top, my spare wheel. That's right? what you do. And I would hook my strap to that, and then just put five feet, you know, of sand the on top. The heaviest thing that you can actually like submerge 
the is biggest she, two, yeah. 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 Area wise, yeah. I think in Lance's scenario, they did that and it still wouldn't hold. It was so so, it was so yeah. Yeah. You know, okay, so this is just unrelated. Um actually it is related. You should read this article I wrote about this Frenchman who after World War II bought a World War II Jeep and got stuck. Well, he, he bought a World War II Jeep and he followed the the uh, trail of a famous French general, drove all through Africa for many months. And there's a he wrote a diary. And in the diary is the experience of him getting stuck in the middle of the desert by himself, like on the absolute verge of death. Like he can't, he, he, the clutch went out. He can't move at all. There's no, there's, there's absolutely no grip in the clutch. So he drops the transmission. The yes. Kids again. You must okay. read this story. It's not my story that's good. It's this man's story. It's this guy's story, yeah. David Galland. It is the most unbelievable story about a guy who is on the verge of death. He's trying to fix his car in the middle of the desert by himself. And the two things that get him out, alcohol and a jack. And, um, yeah, you just have to read it. Yeah, that, that's a good one. I'm saving that one for tonight. Yes. I'm going to read that. <laughs> There are also it's plenty of people out in, uh, you know, like somewhere in Utah that'll claim the same. Oh, yeah. Alcohol. Oh, yeah. Okay, so um, unrelated to anything again, something that I've been wondering a lot. I like this game. He's so, asking us the questions. <laughs> which is yes. What is the next wonder? Okay, so I, I always hang out with my friend Brandon, who's a, you know, he and I, he's the only person on earth. I know is obsessed as obsessed about Jeeps as I am. So anytime we hang out, we're constantly just thinking about Jeep stuff. Mm -hmm. And I think if I could go back 20, 30 years and interview anyone, it would be a motor pool mechanic from World War II. Mm. I would kill to know what sort of failures they were seeing in the field on World War II Jeeps. Because here's the thing. World War II Jeeps now, like if you buy one, the big things are like the transmissions aren't the best and they pop out of second gear. And like, there are some things that people just know that they don't last. But remember, we were only there for a couple of years. So it's like, yeah. I mean, think about it. It's possible that like these things are driven for, they're, they're driven hard. Yes. But only for a couple of years. So it's like, did they fail at high rates, even though they were only driven for like, were you seeing a, a failure in like six months? Or a year, or were these, or were they just stout? Like I wonder. Like it's, aside from obvious damage from battle, right? And it's the same. Well, weren't they the same jeeps that they then used in Korea, kind of stuff, or like medevac and stuff like that? Very like, similar, similar yeah. Korea, Korea, yeah. But they were also exclusively used under duress. Yeah, you know, it wasn't like they were just driven lightly. You know, my understanding is that anytime they were in motion, they were really in motion. Yeah. Right. Those tires yeah. just look so uncomfortable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The NDTs, non-directions. Yeah. Yeah. You know, they were doing engine swaps. Like we know, we know, like in the in the flat fender Jeep world, there's this motor pool spec designation, which is like a, a correct Jeep that has the wrong engine in it. Because in the motor pool, they were just like rebuilding engines and throwing this engine in that Jeep or whatever. But, like, man, imagine that you're rebuilding a one year old engine, like driven maybe a couple thousand miles. And it maybe, I, I just wonder, like, what was happening to these vehicles? Like, what, what was breaking and why? But what were, like, what was tolerance for building, you know, an engine back then? Yeah. I still man. always wondered about the, the image with that, the willies with the two dudes, like, up in the air. I was like, I wonder. How many back surgeries those guys had? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and did anyone get sued? Did Willis yeah. Oakley get sued? Exactly. Oh, like, no, no, these two soldiers. It was like, <laughs> listen here, boys. This is I... not going to feel good, but this is your duty. Look at this. This is the early one. Reenact that photo with like a Polaris razor. It's, it, it looks like he literally could have hit his forehead on that windshield. Oh, no doubt. There's no, there's no, there's no belt of any sort. Yeah. Like he's you know, going forward when that lands. You guys need to interview my friend Brandon. He's with Jeep. He is literally the world's foremost expert on flat fender Jeeps. Okay. World War II era Jeeps. Okay, 
Uh, there might be one or two old timers who can give him a run for his money, but it's unbelievable what he knows. It's it, literally unbelievable. Like he will, he, <laughs> he will be able to tell you the bolt specs of every part. It, it, it's just not normal, but I love it. It's very nerdy. I like it. Uh, I still, yeah, I think it's good. All right. Do you have any other, any other overlanding ones? Oh, no. Um, You're just out. that, um, <laughs> just that I'm really excited about. It. Well, one, one note I will make. I bought two, you know, two parts vehicles, the Virginia one and the Wisconsin one. Yeah. And you would think, okay, two parts vehicles, you just merge them and then you have one vehicle. Turns out it's freaking horrible. Like cars were meant to go together in a very specific order. Yes. And once, once you're screwing that up, you have to realize the, the, the nice body parts vehicle, all the parts that have been removed, the person got them out by just hacking away everything around them. Yeah, and then of course, and then the green Jeep that I'm taking parts from, I don't want to. I, I, I some of the stuff I can hack away, but some of the stuff I can't. So I have to disassemble half the dang Jeep just to get like one thing that I need, and then I'm putting it in the new <laughs> one, Which and is- I have to replace all the other stuff that's been broke. It's like it's yeah. horrible. Don't you can't. A, you have to realize like a parts vehicle is a vehicle that someone has completely given up on it's yes. no longer a car mm-hmm. it the soul is gone it's no longer a viable transportation method so to use a parts vehicle as a, a, an overlanding vehicle that needs to be reliable it's the dumbest thing i don't know what i was thinking <laughs> <laughs> i think that's a great point to wrap up the show tonight <laughs> for real yeah yeah uh david is there anything you'd like to plug <laughs> Um, not really. Just um, um, just no. Just keep watching this great podcast, listening to it. Um, Chris and Ross are the best. So, <laughs> we'll take if you want to follow my Instagram, you can do it. But do it. You know, there's some you know off roady stuff. And and read your your things. Follow along. Yeah, exactly. some articles. Yeah, yeah. Well, sweet. I'm gonna wrap it up then. You can rate and review the show on Apple Podcasts. I didn't say iTunes tonight, except I just said iTunes right there. Uh, you can like and subscribe to the YouTube channel. We do. Uh, we're like part of a trial program. You can watch the podcast on Spotify. So if you listen to the show on Spotify, the the video that's also on YouTube is available through the Spotify app as well. Uh, yeah. I don't, I don't know if that's special or not, but when I loaded the show to our hosting uh, software the other day, they were like, do you want to put the video on Spotify too? It's like, yes, yes, I do. <laughs> Why not? Uh, David on Instagram is David N. Tracy. The letter N. That's how I know we're not truly related because all the people on my side have D for middle initials. Oh. <laughs> That's the only reason. That's the only reason. That's what you think. <laughs> uh, you could follow you. We follow Hooniverse, <laughs> the Hooniverse on Twitter, the Real Hooniverse on Instagram. You can read read what we write on Hooniverse, UTV Driver, ATV Writer, Everyday Driver, US News and World Report, and then mm-hmm. you can follow Ross at No Not Like the One from Friends, and I'm at Overlanding Dad, and that's it. We did it. We did the show. Thank you, David. Thank you so much. Thanks, guys. David.